Holy shit, the PlayStation 5 has finally been announced, and it's coming with 8K graphics, built-in SSD, ray tracing, and potentially backwards compatibility with the entire PlayStation line. Oh, and don't forget about having the same sensorious policies that got a finished localization banned, rendered a game actually unplayable, and even forced a beloved game producer to quit his own franchise. Yeah, they had us the first half, I'm not gonna lie. 8K graphics. The average console user doesn't even have an 8K television. Built-in SSD. Those are damn near standard even in a low-end PC at this point. Ray tracing. What, are you going to make games look exactly 5% better in exchange for a 50% price increase? And potentially backwards compatibility with the entire PlayStation line. Okay, now you have me a bit more- And it's currently rumored to be priced at $500. Yeah, I'm being a bit of a wet bag here, but what did you expect? Sony in my mind has burned almost all the goodwill they've built up over the years. I mean heck, even my jaded heart was momentarily softened by the rumor that the PS5 could be possibly backwards compatible with the company's entire historic backlog. You meet a female warrior monk who was injured in the battle against the demons. But not even 48 hours after that, articles started popping up about a Sony spokeswoman coming out to reaffirm the existence of their policies on sexual content in Japan. So here we are, part goddamn four, I think, of Sony's walled garden. Now obviously, I can't read the original Wall Street Journal article reporting on this due to their paywall, but luckily, there are other outlets to report on the findings, links below, for now and their statements are just as cringe-inducing as one would expect. Sony is concerned the company could become a target of legal and social action, a Sony official in the US told the Wall Street Journal. I don't know about legal, but articles go even deeper on this to attribute streaming and the wide audience it grants as one of the reasons for the new guidelines. Uh, dude, what about- I'm getting to it. With an excerpt from one article saying, so even if the content in games is more socially acceptable in one region than another, there's no guarantee that releasing it only where it's acceptable would prevent the company's image from being tarnished in other markets. This boldly shows these guidelines are not aimed universally, but are squarely aimed at Japanese fan service culture, as this logic can easily be applied in reverse, but it's not. Violent games are heavily censored in Japan due to their culture, and games like Mortal Kombat are outright not released in that region but the games are still allowed on the platform regardless. And then there's the other reason Sony cites for these guidelines in the Wall Street Journal's report. The Me Too movement. <laughs> that is less of a can of worms and more of a Pandora's box, so I'll be brief. Regardless of your opinions on the movement, the facts are that a company is citing the censorship of fictional entertainment as caused by Me Too. You can choose to put full responsibility of censorious practices on the movement, you can choose to believe that Sony is simply trying to minimize the criticisms of their own decision by relating it to a bigger event. But the reality of the matter is that Sony attributes the Me Too movement that spawned in the United States as a reason to censor games in Japan, even if they're not going to be released outside of that country's borders. Now I'm going to be honest with you, this is not surprising to me. but. It is also not the most alarming thing in this report. Continuing further, the Sony spokeswoman says that these guidelines established on top of the existing ESRB systems were put in place so that, quote, creators can offer well-balanced content on the platform. Yes, like the Sony-backed Life of Black Tiger, but again, still not the worst thing here. Obviously, a well-balanced platform would mean that there would be content for everyone, including content that may be targeted at a specialized demographic, like those who enjoy gratuitous sexuality or those who enjoy gratuitous violence. But the real kicker is in the follow-up line. A Sony spokeswoman confirmed the company has established its own guidelines so that creators can offer well-balanced content on the platform and gaming, quote, does not inhibit the sound growth and development of young people. Now the first thing that comes across is, Ah oh, shit, here we go again. But it goes deeper than that. And this is the real bulk of my frustration. In one line, PlayStation has conceded multiple arguments that have been thrown against video gaming over the years with the desire to regulate the industry. By bringing in the, quote, sound growth and development of young people, into the conversation, not only do they confirm that within PlayStation they have no illusions about young children consuming mature video games, 
which, let's be clear, are the primary targets of this censorship, they also concede to the idea that fictional content affects people in real life. Remember, no rush. Gamers, game companies, they have all fought tooth and nail against politicians, including our current president, making these very same claims. But the second it isn't Mortal Kombat's ass on the line, they throw the games, its developers, and its fans under the bus. Also, despite me using them as a primary comparison, I don't have much of a problem with MK11. Sure, they are being hypocritical about skimpy women being unrealistic while guys fight half naked, but if they want to alienate old fans, then that's their choice as a company. At least they gave some real fan service with their launch trailer. Here's hoping the tournament scene doesn't dry up the second Warner Brothers stops injecting money into it. The only thing worse in my mind than that betrayal of principles is the way they have treated their Japanese developers throughout all of this. These guidelines aren't even in writing yet, with a Sony official saying, quote, they were introduced kinda suddenly, and a Japanese studio telling the Wall Street Journal that, quote, you don't know what they will say until you've completed the work and submitted it for a review. Picture working on something that takes months or even years to complete, but then only at the end do you get told, that's wrong, fix it, regardless of how deeply ingrained that aspect is. And what do they gain from these edits? Disgruntled consumers misinformed on the upcoming product like Dead or Alive? Disappointed consumers who were given a choice to vote on an upcoming DLC but told their choice had to be replaced by the runner-up, like in the Japanese-only Love R? or maybe outright angry customers leaving a bad review on the product, like in the case of the newest Japanese Hyperdimension Neptunia game. It's no wonder that Kenshiro Takaki, the creator of Senran Kagura, chose to eventually walk away from his own franchise after realizing that they would need to scrap all of their existing plans for Senran Kagura 7. And while I made a little meme at the announcement of his departure on my Twitter, I was quite serious. Many of the things people enjoy about the existing Senran Kagura franchise will most likely be absent from future releases, if they do any games at all past the most likely contractually obligated 7. And for those thinking Microsoft will sweep in like a proper competitor and snatch away all these disgruntled consumers, I sincerely doubt it. Not only because they refuse to comment in the Wall Street Journal article, though I'm not surprised since much like Riot Games they are also having their own dealings with Me Too, so they probably want to avoid any topic that brings up the 5 letter hashtag. No, it's just that the Xbox has notoriously been unable to really penetrate the Japanese market. So instead, those hopes should lie with Nintendo. A quote from the Wall Street Journal article, Nintendo said it doesn't regulate sexual content beyond requiring game makers to obtain a rating from national bodies, even pointing out that its game system allows responsible parents to restrict content based on its rating. And so far, Nintendo has held to that releasing not only various Senran Kagura titles in both Japan and the West, but also being the holder of the least censored versions of many multiplat visual novels. Heck, the one time Nintendo actually did force an edit was with a game that had actual nudity that went against the Japanese Sero system. So if you like fan service and still prefer to have a console over the PC platform, oddly enough, the Nintendo Switch is the current go-to. What an odd timeline we live in. And for those who are considering supporting PlayStation by eventually getting a PS5 or even currently a PS4, I'm not saying not to. That is not the purpose of this video. If you enjoy games with more mature elements, or let's be frank, fan service, wow. then understand what PlayStation has done in the past, what they are doing in the present, and what they will probably do in the future with the PlayStation 5. I want you informed on how they are treating the developers of the games you like how they will be less likely to sell the games that you like, and how they will be more likely to edit the games that you like. I just want to be able to play my Vanillaware titles unedited, and if that's all PlayStation is able to entice me with in the future, then that's that. Which is why I opened up this video with my criticisms of the announced features of the PS5. As far as I'm concerned, they are no longer deserving of the benefit of a doubt when it comes to their product. But with that, I'll see you guys next time, with hopefully a more fun video. Also, when did they bump up the price of PlayStation Plus? Hell, when did they make it mandatory in the first place? Back in my day, the online was free. Come on PlayStation, what you doing?